Let's keep in mind as we go through this, when you say, well, what was Paul saying in relationship to the time of the rapture and the Antichrist and the falling away? It's right there in the first four verses. It just totally destroys the preacher view of the restrainer being either the church or the Holy Spirit, or i.e. the Holy Spirit in the church taking off and the church escaping the tribulation period. Welcome back to the Good Fight Radio Show. I'm your host, Chad Davidson of Good Fight Ministries. And with me, as always, is the president and founder of Good Fight Ministries and pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley, California, Pastor Joe Schimmel. How are we doing today? Well, as you know, it's a fight to get here, man. But here we are, <laughs> and I'm ready to fight the good fight for what the Word of God says about the second coming and its timing and dealing with a wrench that people try to throw into it to try to say there's two second comings or a secret second coming for second coming, but we're going to... We're going to deal with that. I'm excited. <laughs> Amen. And you know what? I'm excited about this too. And guys, this is so important to us as a ministry because it is, and I haven't even let out the title, neither did Joe yet, about what we're going to be talking about. But when it comes to this issue, we're going to spend an entire hour on this. We're not going to cut this up and chop this up into two half hours for video purposes or anything like that. We're going to dig into this for an entire hour because I would say this argument is brought forth a lot when it comes for the pre-trib rapture doctrine and the basic question is from second thessalonians chapter 2 a verse that is typically a stronghold for post-trib believers Mm -hmm. but pre-tribbers like to take another verse and i'm going to read the text and then i'll tell you what we're going to be answering and maybe you might get a little bit of hint after i finish reading the text we'll be dealing with. Second Thessalonians, the second chapters. If you got your Bibles, open them up. It's a great time to get into the Word with us. It says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, regarding the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. No one is to deceive you in any way. For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things and you know what restrains him now so that he will be revealed in his time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is removed. So with all of that, we are going to be talking about the restrainer. And as I said, this is a stronghold a lot of times for pre-tribs, but there are a number of views as to who the restrainer is, or in some instances, what the restrainer is. And so we want to go over all of those. In fact, we're going to go through 10 different views regarding the restrainer. So, so Joe, is there anything you want to say before I give you the first one? Yeah, I want to say, you know, as you're setting this up, when you look at this passage, Paul's very, very clear as to when the rapture will take place in relationship to the apostasy of the fallen away, and the Antichrist. I mean, when Chad read it, it was spelled out. But then there's this obscure verse, uh, which talks about, you know, the Antichrist won't be revealed until the restrainer is taken out of the midst or out of the way, or, you know, there's different ways that that's translated. And many hop on that one obscure verse and say, and then all of a sudden they import their own, you know, (laughs) beliefs into it or what they want it to say to help them arrive at a pre-trib rapture. However, there's several different views that we'll look at, and we'll be looking at, since we're looking at 10 views, we're going to be looking at some of them just really quickly, boom, 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 because some are really pretty easy to refute. Uh, Let's keep in mind as we go through this, uh, and when you say, well, what was Paul saying in relationship to the time of the rapture and the Antichrist and the fallen away? It's right there in the first four verses, and we'll get into that later because it just totally destroys the preacher view of the restrainer being either the church or the Holy Spirit, or i.e. the Holy Spirit in the church taking off and the church escaping the tribulation period. So, uh, but we're going to look at that. So, I would, yeah, I definitely want to look at uh, uh, what are the what are the views and what views. So, what I'm going to do is to work up to the most popular views, two or three most popular. The last one won't be the most popular, but I believe it's the biblical view, especially if you keep in mind context is king and scripture interprets scripture. And the Bible's own best interpreter, 
but is the Holy Spirit by the Bible itself using Scripture with Scripture. So when we do that, we start to realize what Paul's doing, the larger context, it becomes a slam dunk. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I guess that that gives us right into our first topic as to let's place a restrainer title here, right? So instead of who the restrainer is, now we're going into the what's. Because some believe that this what is who? a yeah. what situation. So the what would be, is the restrainer the Roman government? Yeah, let's keep in mind, when we go to this text, it's hard to be dogmatic. Uh, it's been called, you know, one of, you know, Paul's, you know, one of the most enduring, enigmatic, uh, exegetical problems or obscurities to, to deal with with regard to Paul's writings. Uh, the Roman Empire... Uh, some of the church fathers felt that way, but evidently not. <laughs> the Roman Empire ceased to exist about 1,500 years ago, and if it was what was holding the Antichrist at bay, and keep in mind that hindering there is it, the lawless one won't be revealed. And Paul's talking about him being revealed in the temple, showing himself that he's God. That's the context. And he won't reveal because until he that now hinders continues to hinder King James or the restrainer continues to restrain uh, until he is moved out of the way or moves from the midst uh, would be, couldn't be the Roman Empire because if that was what was holding him back. Then when the Roman Empire ceased to exist, well, he should have emerged then because it's been about over 1,500 years since the Roman Empire has been in power. Well, okay, well, I guess we'll move on oh, from that Let's one. go a little further on okay. that one in case someone says, well, what about, you know, maybe they'll be revived. Well, oh, that's hasn't been point. here for yeah, all these times. But hey, also, uh, there is a, the first one in the, in the Greek is neuter, and that could refer to more, a more general, non-specific, personal being. Yeah. But the second time you see restrainer, it's he. It's a masculine pronoun. It's, it's speaking of an, a, a, an agent, a, a, a personal agent. He being either a spirit or a an angel or a, a human being. Some believe it's even a specific human being, which we'll get into in a little bit, uh, which I don't believe it's speaking of a specific human being. So uh, the Roman government wouldn't fit the second usage of restrainer there. He uh, don't usually speak of the Roman government or and Paul certainly did as that I'm aware of as a he. No, oh, okay. Well, I, yeah, I think that's really good because do a lot of people will say, well, it's going to be this revived Roman government and so forth. And so I guess the next one would be: Is the restrainer specifically the binding of Satan? Yeah, that won't work either, <laughs> uh, because you know you have at least Satan being bound here. So you have some scriptural not support of this being the restrainer, but the idea that Satan can be restrained. And he's restrained definitely at the end of the uh, at the beginning of the thousand year period. That's in Revelation chapter twenty. However, the restraining that Paul is talking about is restraining that's talking that's taking place in his day. He that now hinders is hindering. He that is restraining is restraining. And Paul says he's restraining the spirit of lawlessness, the the mystery of iniquity, uh, the, the the spirit of antichrist, as John calls it. And, and Paul calls it the mystery of iniquity or the mystery of lawlessness that is already at work. And he's not even I don't believe talking about general lawlessness. But he's talking about that that eschatological lawlessness that brings forth the Antichrist and the spiritual diabolical dark powers that bring him forth in the end of days. So uh, and keeping these demonic diabolical powers at bay. So uh, it's kind of you know it's really hard to understand it as being the binding of Satan. Meaning in Revelation twenty, which is what a lot of people say. Oh, it's the binding of Satan. You know, in, Re- in Revelation chapter twenty, Satan's bound. Yeah, he's bound after the second at the second coming of Christ when Christ comes in Revelation nineteen. Uh, and that's still future. Jesus hasn't returned yet, and he's bound at Christ's second coming. He's bound for a thousand years. Uh, we're talking about someone who's being bound right now, someone who's restraining right now, not Satan being restrained later, but being restrained right now, and then allowed to come or to bring forth uh, the Antichrist and so forth. So that doesn't fit the chronolo- chronology of the book of Revelation or the end times because the restrainer, whoever it is, is holding the Antichrist back, and he's not unleashed or allowed to uh, have power until the middle of the seven years of Daniel, the 70th week, that seven-year period, in the middle of the 70th week, because the context is him sitting in the temple. He's being withheld from sitting in the temple of God to show himself as, as God. So when Satan is allowed to do that by the Lord, then he will pick an Antichrist. If Satan was allowed to years and years and years ago, uh, and God stopped restraining him, he could pick a man to be the Antichrist, but he's going to pick a, a specific man at a specific time in the Lord's timing. And it's not. It's definitely not the binding of Satan in Revelation 20. That's the millennial binding. All right. Well, I guess if it's not the binding of Satan, another one would people would say is that it actually is Satan. The restrainer is Satan. What would we say to that? Yeah, and that that view, some people, very minority, a lot of people believe that view. Not that that makes it wrong, but 
It's just doesn't really fit the grammar there uh, because the contrast, I, pr- I specifically believe when it first speaks of the restrainer that it's in the neuter to contrast it with, uh, I, I should say, the Holy Spirit or the uh, the church or the Archangel Michael or whoever it is is being spoken of. And we have a definite conviction on who it is, but I'm just throwing out the views right now. Whoever it is is spoken of as a, as a he the second time. But the first time he's spoken of, he's spoken of in the neuter, you know, and uh, which is kind of interesting because that wouldn't seem to fit Satan. And the neuter is, I believe, contrasting with the he that's being held back, you know? And there's a distinction between the one being held back and the one who's holding him back. And then the second time you see the one holding back the restrainer, he's he's a he because now God's getting, let us know there's a personal agent of God's holding him back. So that doesn't, the grammar doesn't fit it in more ways than one, which we don't have time to get into, but uh, that view is not accepted by almost any scholar uh, for obvious reasons. Yeah, I think that one's uh, pretty out there, but it is a view. So it's yeah. great. Uh, guys, these are some of those things, and you would be surprised about some of the things that are sent in that people hold to. So we want to make sure we answer as much as we can without going too far off the rails here. All right, well, the next one that people may say, and this is more of an it, I guess, as well, um, and we've been doing a number of videos, specifically a uh, number of teachings, uh, specific on Israel. So some people are saying that the restrainer itself is, in fact, Israel itself. Right, and then Israel will cease to exist or cease to be able to be a power that uh, is able to resist. And uh, that would mean we're not anywhere near the end times because uh, Israel is quite resistant. And Israel doesn't really, as you already alluded to, Chad, doesn't really fit the he, you know. Uh, Although God can speak of Israel as a he, to be fair, at times. uh, But typically, uh, you know, we seem to have an agent, a personal agent involved in but we have to say okay we can't discard that because of he i don't believe it's as strong with israel as it would be say with the roman government yeah. however it doesn't fit with israel because israel uh the time of the tribulation is called jacob's trouble and the antichrist sits up shop in at the, on the temple mount in the temple and he abominates the temple causes the desolation and he desolates the temple by uh standing in the holy place and he set up the abomination of desolation which will stand in the holy place he himself sits in the temple of god showing himself that he is god and Israel is in power at this time, and many of them receive them. Jesus said, I come by Father's name, you receive me not. If another one comes in his own name, him you will receive, speaking of the Antichrist. And at that time, Israel passes through a fire of testing, where we read that where two-thirds are destroyed in the in fire. There's refining that goes on. Those who endure come forth as silver, and so forth. And the Lord uses this time of Jacob's trouble as a time of trial for Israel. So Israel is not all of a sudden just saying, uh, it doesn't just get out of the way. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't fit because Israel has become a nation again, and they're in power right now. And uh, I don't think there's anything really to commend personally to commend that view. Yeah, I think that would be a very tough one to try to uh, argue. <laughs> All right. Well, moving forward on our list, the next one is the providence of God. Can the providence of God, or is the providence of God, what is being spoken about as the restrainer here in Second Thessalonians chapter two? Yeah, that's, to me personally, uh, when I read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, it, it, it seems to strongly indicate that he represents a specific entity. Uh, and if he meant the Lord, he would have said, well, God, until God stops restraining him. But he, he, he says, he who restrains him will continue to restrain him until he, you know, is uh, taken out of the way, or that which restrains, general, neuter, until he, masculine pronoun, is taken out of the way. Uh, and it sounds like someone's being taken out of the way, although I do believe that the, the Greek construction there can refer to somebody actively. It's in the middle voice, which I don't want to get too technical, but it's not in the passive. And you can read a middle as active, but you don't usually read a middle as passive. So uh, it, it very well could be that this one is moving himself out of the midst, uh, this, this he. But it doesn't seem to really fit the providence of God there because it seems too specific as though there's a specific agent holding the back and not generally just God's providence. Yeah, that seems very, that's a very interesting uh, view as well. Well, okay, so the Bible's very clear when it comes to the preaching of the gospel, that the gospel of the nations will be, or the gospel will be preached over the whole world, and then the end will come, right? Yeah, that's right. So the view would be... Now this is another view. This is about. another view. So we're moving from providence of God to now that the restrainer is actually the preaching of the gospel. Can that be the restrainer? So as long as the gospel is being preached... The Antichrist is being restrained. Uh, I don't know why the preaching of the gospel would restrain the Antichrist. 
Uh, in fact, Satan's very active in trying to blind people from the gospel and stealing the seeds. It doesn't banish him from coming to any kind of power. Uh, and it would contradict uh, a verse that you just brought up, Matthew 24, 14, Chad, where Jesus said, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, then the end will come. So the gospel is being preached all the way until the end of time. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus said in verse 18, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. And then verse 19, you know, go ye therefore in all the world, you know, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even at the end of the age, as they preach the gospel. He's with them to the end of the age. And the gospel is being, even you say, well, yeah, but a lot of believers will be killed at that time, and the gospel won't be as prominent. Well, the gospel is going to be more prominent. You have the two witnesses who won't be able to be killed for 42 months. You have an angel in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, who's preaching the gospel in the mid-heavens, you know, and they're not, not going to stop that angel. So the gospel is definitely being preached uh, during the tribulation period, and it's not the gospel ceasing to exist or be preached during the tribulation period. Well, I think that one uh, is thoroughly answered there. <laughs> I think, I <laughs> little time we have, you know. Pretty, that one's uh, not, not too tough. So, so the, the, these are important. So we've gone through one, two, three, four, five, six different views on what this restrainer could be. And people hold to these views, so we're trying to make sure we give enough credence to the point of actually answering them. So the next one is interesting because you have the Apostle Paul writing 2 Thessalonians, but this viewpoint would actually say that Paul was writing about himself and he is actually the restrainer. Yeah, a uh, man by the name of Coleman, he he teaches that. Well, he say the neuter refers to the general preaching of the gospel and the he that Paul's speaking of is Paul himself, that it was because of through, through Paul that the Antichrist is being hindered from coming uh, into, you know, prominence and sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Uh, that doesn't work. The Apostle Paul was killed in the late 60s, uh, according to the uh, church tradition and you know history, uh, beheaded by Nero. And so in the last 1900 years, we haven't seen the Antichrist. So if, if Paul was holding forth the mystery of iniquity and Satan for bringing forth the man of lawlessness, uh, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense either. Yeah, I don't see uh, Paul making a lot of sense here for this text whatsoever. But as you said, you mentioned Coleman, and there are those who hold to these things. So we want to make sure we try to answer them whenever we can. And guys, you're listening to the Good Fight Radio Show. We're talking specifically about the restrainer. Now, we've already read through 2 Thessalonians, and now we are going to be digging into three of the biggest views, I'd say, three of the most popular views concerning who the restrainer is. And this one, this is why we kind of went through those ones. You went through them pretty quickly, but hopefully that will suffice in terms of giving you a good answer as to why none of those uh, seven could actually meet the requirement. I'm sorry, none of those six. Is that six or seven? No, seven, yeah. Seven. Right. None of those seven could actually meet those re the requirements. But I think it gets a little more tricky here, and we got to really dig in here because the next one is a very, very popular one, yeah. especially as we talked about in the beginning, when it comes to those who believe in a pre-trib rapture. And I think that the next two that we go over, a lot of times I see them kind of intertwined a lot of times when they're explained mm -hmm. um, one way or the other. But nonetheless, this view is that it's actually the church, that the church is actually the thing that is restraining. So And so therefore, the church is the restrainer. So Joe... Why can the church not be the restrainer? How about that? Yeah, when you look at all these different views, and we're not like belittling the people that hold these different views, right. uh, you know, it's it's enigmatic. We agree that it's, you know, it's a little mysterious what's Paul, who's Paul referring to there. But we do believe when you put scripture with scripture, it blows you away how clear it becomes. I mean, to me, it's like, to me, it becomes very, very obvious. Uh, and I don't say that with scriptures that are, you know, uh, obscure that have no support elsewhere. Uh, that there's an obvious uh, interpretation. But whether it's Oscar Coleman saying, hey, you know what, it's the Apostle Paul, he's the he there, or others, uh, you know, at least, you know, they're trying to understand, they try to give forth a viewpoint. But the next two viewpoints, that it's the church, number eight, or it's the Holy Spirit, as we'll look at later, number nine, uh, these views are believed widely because they're used to support the idea that we'll be raptured before the uh, Antichrist takes his seat in the temple. And... Uh, pre-tribs actually say uh, that, you know, uh, that the church, some pre-tribs, uh, I remember Dave Hunt, you know, saying, you know, in one of the books I got by him years ago when I was a younger believer, saying, yeah, if, if the Antichrist was revealed while the church was here, the church could stop him, you know, church would blow the whistle on him and so forth. And I'm like shaking my head. I'm like, Dave, you know what? We're, the church is 
so inept, you know, and it was after, you know, Swigert had fell and Baker fell and these, you know, prominent, quote unquote, leading evangelists and so forth. The church had already had such a black eye and uh, the church has already lost a lot of its prominence and power and strength. And that which claims to be the church, the Roman Catholic church, which is not the church, has prominence, but a lot of that movement, the Pope, and otherwise, I believe, will actually support the end time movement. Hopefully, there'll be an exodus of many Pope Catholics. Francis makes sense. a lot of sense for that, but <laughs> yeah, it's playing some kind of role. Possibly, we'll see. You know, uh, but uh, the church to say it's the church. First of all, uh, let's just get this out right off the bat. You never ignore the clarity of a declaration in a passage, and then ignore what it states regarding for instance, the time of the rapture regarding the church, and then take that which is obscure and interpret it as though it's clear and then reinterpret that which is clear as though it's obscure and has to bow down to that which is obscure. And what I mean by that is Paul very clearly states that the church will not be raptured until the Antichrist is revealed. So to turn around and ignore that and then to say, oh, the restrainer has to be taken away and that must be mean the church. So the church has to be raptured before the Antichrist is revealed. So then what you'd have, you have Paul contradicting himself because you're importing what you want to believe in their preacher rapture. You'd have him utterly contradict himself because you'd have Paul saying concerning the rapture of the church, uh, don't be deceived. It's not going to happen until the Antichrist is revealed first. But by the way, the Antichrist can't be revealed until the rapture of the church happens first. That would be an utter contradiction if you say that the, re the restrainer is the church. And let's just read the text and see how that would be a contradiction. Now, with re we request you, brethren, for chapter 2, verse 1 of 2 Thessalonians, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together, okay, to him. That's the rapture. So Paul is speaking to them, and he wants to warn them regarding the coming of the Lord and our being gathered together to him, i.e. the rapture that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit, meaning a demon, a demon wanted to deceive you on this, or a message, maybe a prophecy, false prophecy perhaps, about a secret coming, Margaret MacDonald, check out our video left behind, let us stray, or a letter as from us, as though a counterfeit letter or, or as Paul in his letters is somehow teaching that this gathering is going to be before the Antichrist, pre-trib. He says, concerning Christ coming, I've been gathered together to him. Don't be deceived by a spirit or a letter as from us or a message as from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come or the King James has is at hand, meaning imminent, any moment. Or the, probably the best translation here, and I've studied the Greek in this quite extensively, uh, it's probably best translated has come to be at hand. I mean, it's, it's coming or it's very imminent. And he says, let no one in any way deceive you for it will not come. What will not come? What's the subject here? The coming of the Lord to gather us together. That's the context. The coming of the Lord to gather us together. He says it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. The fallen away. Okay? And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes a seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So Paul makes it really clear that concerning Christ coming, I'll be gathered together to him. Don't let anybody see you by any of these three means. That day, Christ coming, the day of Christ, to come and gather us together. The rapture will not come until there's a fallen away and then the Antichrist. And then he'll come to gather us. That's the exact order the Lord Jesus Christ gave when they asked about the sign that's coming at the end of the age. He said that to endure to the end because many would fall away. There's the apostasia. And then he said, you'll see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. There's the Antichrist in the temple. And then he says immediately after the tribulation, there's, he'll gather his elect, same, by the way, uh, same Greek cognate there for gather in 2 Thessalonians 2 and in Matthew chapter 24. Then, so you have the fallen away, the Antichrist, Christ coming to gather his, his, the saints, Matthew 24, Jesus teaching, Paul teaching the same thing Jesus taught. Uh, and then Jesus warning about a secret coming that would precede that. Don't, if they say I'm in the secret chambers, don't go for it. Paul also warning about a coming that would precede that, that that's not real. And so we have Paul making it really clear that the rapture will not take place until the fallen away and the Antichrist come first. And then he says in verse 5, Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that his time, that he may be revealed. And now the context of Revelation, keep this in mind, it's important for later, so we can identify who this restrainer really is, is that he's not being revealed in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So understand, he's talking about the abomination of desolation, that the Antichrist revealing himself in the temple of God, showing himself that he's God. He says, we know what restrains him. Now, 
We don't have what Paul said to them specifically, so we don't know specifically unless we put Scripture with Scripture. We come to a better understanding, hopefully. Verse 7, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So there's no way, Paul is saying, concerning Christ coming to gather us, don't be deceived. He's not going to come and gather us or rapture us up until the Antichrist and the fallen away happens first, fallen away and the Antichrist happens first. But guess what? They can't happen until the rapture happens first. You have just a total contradiction. So we know it can't be the church. By the way, we also know it's not the church because Jesus warned his apostles, who were the leaders of the early church, that when you see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place, he told them, take off, leave. He used a personal pronoun, you, when you, you see this, when you see that. He took them. He said, you'll be handed over to uh, tribulation. He says, you'll be hated because of my namesake, <coughs> you know? Uh, they'd be hated because of the name of Jesus. If there's a pre-trib rapture, who's going to be hated for the name of Jesus? All the Christians are God. It would make no sense. Uh, so, by the way, we see throughout the book of Revelation, we see the church on earth during the, the uh, book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 13, when it talks about the mark of the beast and how it will be issued forth, and everybody will have to take a mark on the right hand of their forehead, and we'll get by ourselves without it. We read Revelation chapter 13, there was given him a mouth, speaking of the Antichrist, speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name in his tabernacle, that is those who dwell in heaven. And it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Now, who are the saints that he's overcoming? And you can do a word study. You just got get out a, a Greek dictionary. If you have a Strong's, you can just use a Strong's. And look at the word saints as it's used through the New Testament. Hagias, it's used over and over again of New Testament believers, okay? But we need to be a little more specific. Who are the saints in the book of Revelation? Because our pre-trib brothers and sisters say, ah, oh, the saints there, they're the non-believing Jews. You know, after the rapture that Satan's going to persecute. Or the tribulation saints, but they're not the bride of Christ. Really. Just go to Revelation chapter 19, just before the second coming of Christ. Look at what we read in verses 7 through 9. Let us rejoice and be glad. This is after the whore of Babylon has been destroyed with fire before Christ returns. He's getting ready to return. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride, his bride, that's the church, has made herself ready. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. That's what it says. The saints are considered the bride. The brides considered the saints in the book of Revelation. There's not a distinction being made. In fact, you see this, these saints and you see the bride all the way up to the end of the tribulation. I love how the Lord, because he knew this, this, this debate was going to come, he knew that people would try to tell people, don't worry, we're not going to go through that time. You don't have to be ready to endure any tribulation and so forth. God wouldn't let us go through that. He wouldn't let us be tested like that. And That's not, that's, I'm sorry, that's, that's a lie. Okay, It is a lie. It's a sad lie to see you many and the church is being set up for the slaughter. So here we see that the saints are are the, are the bride, and the bride isn't taken until Christ comes back in Revelation 19. There's no rapture in Revelation. You don't see a rapture rate in Revelation chapter, just before chapter uh, uh, 5, when the tribulation period, or chapter 6, when the tribulation period starts. You don't see that. You say, behold, he comes with the clouds, Revelation 1, 7. He comes with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Not a secret coming. And all the earth, you know, shall mourn because of him. The tribes of earth shall mourn because of him, even those who pierced him. And then we see in Revelation 7, verses 9 through 14. And Chad, as I read this passage, let me know if you know of any better, if it's if there's a better one, there's not many, better descriptions of the church in anywhere in the Bible. I love this because as we read after these things, John says, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne of God, or, or throne and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to God forever and ever, amen. Then one of the elders answered saying to me, these who are clothed in white robes, who are they? And uh, where have they come from? I said to him, my Lord, you know, and he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. In other words, they were in the great tribulation. They came out of it. And there's a great multitude that no man can number from every nation, kindred, people, and tongue. And they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You know what? That doesn't make any sense because the, the <laughs> church is being mentioned after chapter 3 of Revelation. That just doesn't make sense. <laughs> 
doesn't if you're pre-trib. That's if you're sure. pre-trib, it doesn't make sense. By the way, that is a common argument that we'll be dealing with in an entire episode of why you don't see the church after Revelation chapter 3, which is not actually true. not true, no. but as you just heard, but nonetheless. No, amen, bro. And it's, it's interesting because not only do you have this glorious picture, I mean, to me, it's the most glorious picture of the church because it's from every single people group on earth, amen. and they're cleansed by the blood of Christ, and they come out of the tribulation, and they're called the bride in Revelation chapter 19, 19. and the bride is on earth there because she's made herself ready. She's not in, in, in heaven getting cleaned up, you know, she's made herself ready through her righteous acts on earth and enduring persecution for Jesus and so forth. So you have, and by the way, keep in mind, we just read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that Paul said the rapture wouldn't happen until the fallen away and the Antichrist happened first. And if you back up to chapter 1 in 2 Thessalonians, we read in chapter 1, Paul says, for all, he says, for after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. The Lord's going to pay back for the wicked things the wicked are doing to the church. He's going to pay them back and to give relief to you who are afflicted. So we're going to get relief, the church. He's definitely talking to the church here, right? Church of Thessalonica. He's going to give relief to you and to us as well, meaning the whole church, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven. Now, when's he going to give the church relief? If you're pre-trib, you believe it's in a secret rapture. He's going to come back and he's going to rapture us before the tribulation, before the seven years goes by, and then the second coming, which is another coming, by the way. you got next for coming there, which doesn't work because it says he'll appear a second time for those who believe, not a second and a third time. But he says he'll be revealed from heaven to give us rest, right? When, he says this, gives us a time stamp, with his mighty angels in flaming fire. That's not a secret rapture. That's it. That's his mighty angels. That's not a secret snatch you and wait seven years. With his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all those who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. And this fits and corresponds perfectly with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when Paul said the dead in Christ will rise first, then we are alive, we caught up to meet them in the air. And they says, when's that going to happen? For the, you know the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night when they're saying peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them. That's real upon a woman with a child, they shall not escape. So the scriptures are very clear. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5, 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we see three specific time periods where the rapture is always put with the destruction of the wicked. And then I'll read one last verse and, let, and take a breath to chat so you can say something. In verse 7, he says, uh, for the mystery of lawless one, uh, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Then verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and to bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. It just all fits like a puzzle piece all fit together. No, it really does. And, you know, as one person may say, oh, but that's just talking about the judgment at the end, which we all believe in judgment. But what is the context of this Second Thessalonians Amen. 1? What is the thing that he's talking about will happen? The church will get there, not the judgment on the other people, but actually that's in, accompanied with it, but it's their relief. And I think that's such yeah. a key thing that is being stated by Paul so clearly that you would have to just go like this while reading it yeah. to not get what I, he's I saying. I beg my preacher friends, look at the text. Read Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Read First Thessalonians 4 and 5. He puts it with the destruction when he comes like a thief of the wicked. He puts Second Thessalonians chapter 1 when he comes with mighty angels with flaming fire. That's when we get our relief. To destroy the wicked at his second coming with his holy angels. And read Second Thessalonians chapter 2. It doesn't happen until the Antichrist is revealed. Then the rapture. Our preacher friends have it all backwards. You need to you need to just bow down to the scripture on this. We love you. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I think I think one of the great things here is we talk about this all the time. You know, the the fact that we actually can find multiple timestamps of when the Absolutely. rapture takes Everywhere. place in Scripture. We, we, we find it without a doubt. We don't have to do shadow games. We don't have to, you know, oh, well, in this wedding feast you do this and, and, and so forth. We can literally say 2 Thessalonians 2 gives us the timestamp. What events will show and be before the rapture? Then Matthew 24, 29 through 31. It is so abundantly clear that once again you have to make up this whole menagerie of nonsense to go around it yeah, to get away do. from what is clearly stated in these timestamps. So that's what we're trying to say is read it so clearly. And that's what we believe is happening a lot of times before we get any, even into the the last group of the of people that believe something about the restrainer that we don't agree with. Before we get even, even get into that one, it's just looking straight at the text and saying, Lord, we want to make sure that we're in obedience to what your word says, that we're saying, hey, let's 
whatever is true. I want to meditate on those things that are true from your word. I don't want to let someone and take someone's word for it. We're just saying read the scripture. 2 Thessalonians 1, 2 Thessalonians 2. You can go, as you mentioned, 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5. Who does he come on the thief like? You already mentioned that. But sorry, I get excited about this too because these are texts that I love and, and adore. And I think when I was first reading 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2, it was just my my mind just it whoa that's so so abundantly clear. clear but nonetheless i i want to i want to get into the the last one that we disagree with in terms of so we we'll go through nine that we disagree with and we'll go through the 10th which we believe is very the, clear the 10th and 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 we're we're running shorter on time than i'd like but we're still doing okay um but nonetheless the last one and this one is a very very popular i would say probably the most popular but you can <laughs> quote me or at least in america i don't know about yeah uh, no you're, you're right uh, probably is. the most popular view and that is that the Holy Spirit is, in fact, the restrainer. And this is not just held by pre-trips. This is even held by those who are involved in pre-wrath, uh, by, by many of those who espouse pre-wrath and so forth. So let's answer this. Is the restrainer the Holy Spirit? Yeah, so here we have this. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, it's the Holy Spirit who's holding him back. Uh, he is the Holy Spirit. It refers to the Holy Spirit. Uh, in fact, Got Questions, Got Questions website, which has a lot of really good answers they do. for, for they believers. Do. Uh I disagree with some of their soteriology. They're their four-point four Calvinists, Calvinist, yeah. right? Uh, and they're, you know, somewhat, you know, well, <laughs> they're pre-trib, definitely yeah. pre-trib. <laughs> and that they state on the restrainer, the church indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God has always been part of what holds society back from swelling the tide of lawless living. So uh, they will say it's the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will be taken out of here. And of course, guess what? They still, they, they, a lot of people still have this view that are pre-trib because they, they say, well, the Holy Spirit's in the church. And if the Holy Spirit leaves, he has to take the church with him. So that's where the rapture takes place, which, by the way, would contradict again everything we were just saying, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, 2 Thessalonians chapter uh, 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13. You know, we go through a bunch of different passages, but it would contradict the very context of what Paul's saying if that's what he's meaning. Now, if someone says it's the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit just steps aside to allow the Antichrist to, you know, exalt himself in the temple— uh, I don't think that's, I still don't think that's accurate because I don't believe it's referring to the Holy Spirit. But you could say that and not jump to this conclusion. It must be the Holy Spirit in the church taking the church off the earth. It's like, where did you get that? So what I'm saying is they jump to these wild conclusions to try to support a pre trib rapture view. And frankly, it's because there's no clear verse and we would be $10,000 poor as a church if there was because we offered $10,000 to just years ago. We had that offer going for some time uh, just for one clear verse that teaches a pre trib rapture. And I was surprised that not more people. Uh, didn't, more people didn't try. It was very public. They tried to even get it because they can. And we have a bunch of quotes from pre-trib leaders. I used it with Dr. Stoffer in my debate with him in Colorado when they invited me up there. I quoted him and others saying there's not a clear verse that teaches a pre-trib rapture. Uh, John Walvert and others admit that. Uh, but they want to take a verse like this, which they know it doesn't clearly teach pre-trib, but they want to impregnate it with their viewpoints, which makes it contradict the first four verses of the passage itself, if you start at 2 Thessalonians 2, 1. But it, 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 I don't believe it refers personally to the Holy Spirit, especially not the Holy Spirit being taken off the earth. Uh, this is what the Got Questions website states, quote, it makes much more sense to say that the Holy Spirit is curbing the devil than a, than a, a political entity or even an angel. The Holy Spirit is the one person with sufficient supernatural power to do the restraining. You catch that? It's kind of interesting. Listen to what they're saying. And I actually got questions. This can be very, very helpful. So we're not down on the website. It's got some great things to say on a lot of questions, you know. But here, mm, they drop the ball, okay? Again, they say it makes more, much more sense to say that the Holy Spirit is curbing the devil. He's the restrainer than a political uh, entity or even an angel. The Holy Spirit is the one person with a sufficient supernatural power to do the restraining. In other words, no angel could restrain the devil. Really? Let me read Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. <laughs> And this isn't even referring to the Archangel Michael, as far as we know. This is just referring to an angel. And guess what? That shows you how a lot of times people think of Satan as like as powerful as God, as though there's some form of dualism. And these folks that, that got questions certainly don't view it that way, thankfully. But a lot of times people give the devil too much power. They think only God could stop him and restrain him by the Holy Spirit. And Well, he's not as powerful as you think. He's way more powerful than us. We need the armor of God. We need Jesus. Amen. But listen to Revelation 21 through 3, when Satan is bound and not just restrained from bringing forth the Antichrist, but bound even more so than that to where he can't even just see the nations all, which he's doing right now. Revelation 21 through 3. And I saw an angel 
Remember, they said an angel couldn't do this. Coming down out of heaven, having a key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain, he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil or Satan. It's really clearly the devil then. And bound him for a thousand years. He bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss. And he's, he's throwing devil, Satan around and everything, and, and locked and sealed it over him to keep him, to restrain him, right? To keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must uh, he must uh, be set free for a short time. So this isn't talking about the binding of Satan, what's going on now as far as him being restrained by this specific angel. But it shows you that to, to say, oh, the Holy Spirit can do this. And they don't have a lot in the, uh, on the subject. When I looked at it, I thought, I wonder what they're saying about this. Because I, you know, I thought, ah, they're pre-trib. And, and yeah, they're saying, but I thought, ooh, interesting. They're basically stepping in it, man. They're basically saying, no, it, it can't be an angel, you know has to be the Holy Spirit. And I thought, wow, man, have they read Revelation chapter 20 that Satan is restrained by an angel for a thousand years and totally restrained where he can't do anything at all? So let's look at this view. Uh, so many pre-tribs, and they say it over and over and over again, is the Holy Spirit's taken off the earth during this time and he stops restraining Satan and uh, the Antichrist. That is so unbiblical. I mean, that's just incredibly unbiblical. In fact, uh, we know in Joel chapter 2, during the tribulation period, it will come after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will display wonders. How do we know he's talking about the end times? I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth. Blood, fire, columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness. Okay, He says, and the moon into blood. These are tribulation events. Before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And by the way, the, old, the, the awesome day of the Lord is the Lord's second coming. Some want to say the day of the Lord is, is that seven-year period. But I can show you all kinds of events. Remember, we just read that that fallen away and the Antichrist happened before the day of the Lord. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. They'll be saved peace and safety during the tribulation period before the day of the Lord, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Elijah comes before the day of the Lord, Malachi. Uh, right here we see that there's pillars of smoke and the, uh, the, the sun is darkened and the moon gives, turns to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. The day of the Lord has to do with his second coming at the very end. It's not the tribulation itself. A period will... Chad, we'll probably do a whole whole hour on that one time. When is the day of the Lord, okay? And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Really? Yes. During this time period. Now, Peter says this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel when the Holy Spirit came upon the church. But then he telescoped it in the future where there'd be pillars of smoke, the, the, the sun being uh, turning black, the, the moon uh, turning blood and so forth, uh, go projecting into the tribulation period. And most, even dispensationalists, understand that he's talking about the tribulation period as well. Most pre-tribbers will say that. But notice what he says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be will be delivered. Well, how do you call upon the name of the Lord? How do you call Jesus? Is, uh, can you call Jesus Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit? No, you cannot, according <laughs> to Scripture. At least. Yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, the latter part of the verse, that no one can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. In fact, you can't be born again unless Jesus, unless you're born by the Spirit. Jesus said you must be born of water and spirit. You, the Holy Spirit has to be here to draw us to Christ. Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. He's going to be very, very active at that time. In fact, we have absolute proof that the Holy Spirit will be here during the tribulation period because thus saith the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this, Mark chapter 13, verses mm -hmm. 10 and 11. Yeah. Jesus said, the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. When they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. And in Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 and 11, uh, every preacher will admit he's talking about the tribulation period. He's talking about what's going on during the tribulation period, whether it's John MacArthur, whoever, you know, these pre-trib uh, brethren will say, yeah, that's the tribulation period. Well, guess what? The Holy Spirit's giving utterance at that time. In fact, he's not only on earth, he's actively uh, speaking and resisting the false gospel through believers as he uses them and their testimony. In fact, speaking of their testimony, Revelation 12, 11, how do we overcome Satan during the tribulation period? They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives even to the point of death. What's the word of our testimony? It's, the, our, the, it's us testifying that Jesus Christ is Lord. And guess what? Revelation 19, 10, uh, John falls at the feet to worship this angel. The angel says, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
okay? So our testimony, testifying that Jesus Christ is Lord, testifying before kings and magistrates, civil leaders, presidents, prime ministers, whoever, that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're not supposed to premeditate. What am I going to say? No, the Holy Spirit's going to just fill us and speak through us like he did through Stephen in Acts chapter 7. We're going to have these radical testimonies. It's going to be such an awesome time as we're filled with the Holy Spirit and God's searching to use people during that time by his Spirit. In fact, we read in Revelation 22, 17, the end of the book of Revelation, the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit, referring to the Holy Spirit, and the bride, referring to the church, say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Guess what? We're going to be testifying with the power of the Holy Spirit for people to come to Christ before the judgment comes and to testify that he is, in fact, Lord. Guess what? The Holy Spirit is definitely on the earth during the tribulation period. It can't be referring to the Holy Spirit. And obviously, it doesn't refer to the Holy Spirit in the church and taking the church because that would contradict what Paul just said a few verses earlier, that the church will not be raptured until the Antichrist is revealed, not that the Antichrist will only be revealed if the church is raptured with the Holy Spirit in it first. Yeah, no, I think that's really great. And the, the Mark 13 text for me, if you know, if I'm being honest, is just the, I mean, it, it to me, it's a slam dunk, you know, with Mark 13, especially when you put it, Together, and you see Mark 13 with Matthew 24, 14, the gospel, the gospel. kingdom preached to all nations, and then the end will come. So you have it there at the end. You have a very similar verse there in Mark 13, 11, in, or 13, 10, and 11. It's just, I mean, it's so clear that God will give you utterance through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there. So anytime you have a place where you have the Holy Spirit actually there in the end times, and then somebody is telling you, well, this restrainer, even though it doesn't bring up the Holy Spirit in that in that portion where he talks about it, this restrainer is the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's got to leave it's like, well, I see that he's there in the end times. And I have an, a precise verse that without a doubt, and you showed multiple, let alone Mark 13. So what we have given you are negative cases against. So we've been talking about the last nine different persons, which the Holy Spirit is definitely a person, or entities. And now we're going to get into the person, I guess. Yeah, there's some personhood there. So the person we believe that the Holy Spirit, or that the restrainer actually is. So Joe... Is the restrainer the I, Archangel Michael? I believe, uh, I'll say, man, if I was ever, if I'm 100% sure about something, Jesus Christ is Lord, 100%, not a tinge of a doubt, no doubt in my heart, my mind. With the Archangel, with the restrainer be the Archangel Michael, I'm at 99 point something, you know, because I was going to leave, uh, you know, room, room for Room for air. the Holy Spirit. Yes, amen. <laughs> <laughs> and his word, and understand it better by the Spirit. But before we go there, I just, this verse just came to my heart while we were, we were sharing. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with water only, but with the water and the blood. And it is a spirit who bears witness because the spirit is the truth. There are three that bear witness, the spirit and the water and the blood. And the three are in agreement. It's, God's not going to leave the world without a witness, and, the, uh, and without a witness of his most incredible witness of Jesus, which is the Holy Spirit, when the world needs him most in the last days. The spirit of prophecy will be there. The Holy Spirit will testify through us. Uh, there's no Holy Spirit leaving. He's not the one that's holding. And if the Holy Spirit was the one that was holding the Antichrist back, there's nothing to say he has to leave the earth. Just says, It would just mean that he would stop holding him back. That's all. You don't have to jump to conclusions. It's the Holy Spirit in the church. Well, what about all the believers that get saved supposedly later, according to the preacher rapture view? They, do they not have the Holy Spirit? If the, the Holy Spirit's not in you, it says in Romans 8. You're none of his. You don't belong to him. As many as are led by the Spirit, these are the children of God. So just there's so many problems with that viewpoint. Yeah, and if you have people getting saved without the Holy Spirit, you have people getting saved in, uh, by other means, which plenty of people do. You're having people get saved with a gospel that was not once and for all delivered to the saints. Yeah, and many hyper dispensational say yeah. it's a different gospel at that time. And it goes even. back to the law and stuff, yeah. and that's a different gospel. That means the angel in midheaven is preaching the everlasting gospel. It's really not the everlasting gospel. And then that angel will be under a curse because Paul said, if an angel preaches another gospel, let him be a curse. But you have some pre-trib say, yeah, it's a different gospel at that time. It's under, you got to work your way and endure, you know, a few works, you know, and so forth. So wrong. We're going to go through it quick. And you know what? Back up, especially if you're listening to this in a way you can back up and listen to this two or three times because I'm going to go really quick. But it's going to be very, very clear. In chapter 12, verse 1, uh, well, first of all, let's just say this to make it really clear. Who is Paul referencing when he talks about the Antichrist sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he's God? What scripture in the Old Testament would he have in mind of this temple being abominated? Jesus talked about the abomination of desolation when the Antichrist sits in the temple. Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 through 17. He said, as was spoken through the prophet Daniel. Yeah. So yeah. Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 has the book of Daniel in mind. 
Daniel talks about how the Antichrist in the middle of the week, at middle of that seven-year period, will desecrate the temple. Well, when Paul's looking at Daniel chapter 7, does he have anybody in mind who would be restraining the Antichrist from coming, would be restraining the work of Satan, who stands guard over God's people to protect them and restrain them from evil? Absolutely. And that's the angel Daniel. It's going to start really clicking Angel for you. Michael. I'm sorry. In the, Daniel. Angel Daniel. <laughs> that's the angel. I don't know that one. Michael. Okay. <laughs> and by the way, he's the one that's called the archangel in Jude chapter 1, which is only one chapter. Verse 9. In fact, he says, the Lord rebuke you to Satan. Okay. He has a relationship against Satan. Uh, we see that very clearly. In chapter 12, verse 1 of Daniel, check this out. And it's chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 that talk about this abomination of desolation over and over again in the temple. And in chapter 12, verse 1, it says, now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. Ooh, man, at what time? During the tribulation period. And he's talking about the middle of the tribulation period, by the way. The very time that the restrainer allows Satan to take over, as far as, you know, to whatever degree. It's the same time. And by the way, listen to what he says. Michael, the great prince who stands guard over over the sons of your people. So guess what? Michael is the great prince. He's the archangel Michael. He's the special angel, the archangel that God set to restrain evil against his people, Israel. And the time of the tribulation is oftentimes, we call it Jacob's trouble. It's going to be a war against the, the, uh, Israel. It's going to be against uh, those who have the testament of Jesus. It says over again, believers in Christ, the church as well. Uh, so it's important to keep this in mind. And by the way, in Daniel chapter 10, there is an angel that's trying to get to Daniel because Daniel's fasting He's humbled himself before the Lord. He's crying out to the Lord on behalf of his people. And the angel is hung up with the prince of Persia, and he can't get to Daniel until, guess what, angel shows up. The archangel Michael shows up and helps him out, you know, because he is in warfare against these entities that make up the spirit of lawlessness, the spirit of Antichrist, the mystery of lawlessness that will bring forth the Antichrist. And he plays a huge role. So we read in chapter 10, verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days, says this angel. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, one of the chief princes came to help me for I had been left there with the king of kings of Persia, which is quite fascinating to me. And by the way, rabbinic, Ancient rabbinic interpretation of Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, regarded the archangel Michael as the one who was restraining Satan and that he would pass by. In chapter 12, verse 1, that he would pass by or he would withdraw himself or he would pass aside, uh, he would uh, stand down and allow Satan to attack God's people. And he'll do that, okay, during this period of time because we have other evidence of that as well. But we see that in Daniel chapter 12. By the way, when does this happen? According to the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, when Satan, when the Antichrist sits at the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, he's being hindered from revealing himself right now by the restrainer. But when the restrainer stops restraining him, he will exalt himself in the temple. When does that happen? According to the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, specifically verse 27, in the middle of the week, right, Chad? Yeah. In the middle of that seven year period, three and a half years into that, that seventh week of Daniel, that last week that's hanging there, that's left, seven and a half, three and a half years goes by. Then the middle of the tribulation period, the last three and a half, which is really the great tribulation period, boom, Satan takes a seat. In the temple. He, he breaks the covenant. We read in chapter 9, verse 27, and he will make a firm covenant, that is uh, the Antichrist, with many for one week, which is the nations and perhaps Israel as well. But in the middle of the week, in the middle of that, that three and a half years, uh, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering and on the wing of abominations. He will come one who makes desolate until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out uh, on the one who makes desolate. So guess what? Who's the one that's withholding the Antichrist from coming forth and doing that? Who's the one? Because what's going to happen at that time? At that time, when Jesus says the Antichrist is the temple, or you see the abomination of desolation in the temple, in the, in the holy place, what did he say? Flee, right? Take off, right? He said there'll be greater tribulation at that time than there was ever before or ever after. Well, that's exactly what we read in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, with regard to the activity of the archangel Michael in his battle with Satan. We read in chapter 12, verse 1, Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise, and there will be time of distress, such as has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. <laughs> and at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. Okay? By the way, that word, that, where it says arise right there, some uh, translations have stand. And by the way, that Hebrew word, and many exegetes point that out, this is how many of the Jews understood it, the rabbinical Jews in that times. It means to stand, it can be translated to stand down, uh, to stand still, 
to cease to be active and so forth. The Greek term in the Septuagint, because this the, the Jewish believers that were uh, the Jewish uh, Old Testament believers that translated Septuagint, which spoke Greek, they translated uh, uh, perikomai, which is in Daniel twelve one, which means that to, to uh, stand. They translate it means to pass by. Okay, which corresponds with ceasing to or to, ceasing to restrain, okay? He won't fight anymore. So what's happening is the Archangel Michael who stands guard over the, so what's happening? There's something going on with the Archangel Michael. He stands guard over the people, but guess what? He does something and now hell breaks forth on earth. The Antichrist breaks forth and there's uh, tribulation like there has never been and there never will be again, according to Jesus, according to Daniel. Well, guess what? We get the answer as to what's going on there when we go to Revelation chapter 12 because Revelation is the book that gives us a deeper understanding of what's going on in the book of Daniel. So listen very carefully to what happens here. Daniel chapter 7, verse, or Revelation chapter 12, chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels. It gives you more. When you're reading Daniel 12, 1, now we're at the middle of the tribulation. That's the middle of the tribulation period. Boom. There's just great tribulation when he who stands guard over uh, his uh, God's people ceases to guard them. And now there's this great tribulation, Jacob's trouble. Well, now in Revelation 12, 7 through 9, you're at the same period of time because it's right when the woman is going to go into the wilderness and be protected, it says, for 1,260 days. That's that last three and a half years. Listen to what we read. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels, he has his own angels, waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole earth, he was thrown down and his angels were thrown down with him. And guess what happens? Then it says, woe to the earth because he has been cast down to you. And that's when there's this great tribulation period. So guess what? He hinders Satan or he is hindering. He's slowing down. He's stopping Satan from doing his incredible work. And then guess what? He stops doing it. He's cast down. And then he says, well, God says, woe to the earth. He's not protecting you guys now. God will still be here with us and he'll get us through it. But why does God allow this? Well, Daniel 12, 7 goes on to say, uh, I heard a man dressed in linen. He was above the waters of the river and he raised his right hand and his left toward heaven and, and he swore to him who lives forever and ever and said, we have four times, times and half a time. That's three and a half years. And soon after, as they finish, listen, as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. God does not protect Israel at this time because he's allowing the power of the holy people who's relying on the power of the United States right now and other powers and not on the Yahweh to be shattered so they can cry out, God, have mercy on us. Blessed is who comes in the name of the Lord. Cry out to the Messiah. And then chapter 12, verse 10 of Zechariah, see him whom they pierce. They see Jesus come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he'll establish his kingdom on earth, and all those who cry out to him will be saved. This fits, the, all the puzzle pieces fit great, and I'm glad we went through this. I, did, I wish we didn't have to cover everything because I had to go through Michael so quick, but I... I think uh, you check it out, man. If it's really good, if it's exactly with what Paul's doing, Paul's referring to Daniel, you go back, you see who the restrainer is. It's the, it's the Archangel Michael. Yeah, and I think uh, we've made a good case here for against those cases, uh, specifically those first nine, and a positive case as well. So you guys can feel hopefully comfortable in this. And we're going to be working through a number of the players in the end times in an upcoming series that we're working on that we're excited to share with you guys soon enough. So thank you guys so much for supporting us, and God bless you guys. We love you guys.